Good morning. Whether you're a member, a longtime friend, a new friend who we haven't met yet, whether you're here in the sanctuary or with us virtually via our streaming, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. My name is Robert Guptel, and I'm here this morning representing the church council. And I have some announcements on council's behalf. We're very excited about something we're calling 10 Years of Transformation. Now, 10 Years of Transformation is a four-month-long celebration of our journey to this space that we currently inhabit and to the space and to the journey that is ongoing. It's going to feature many events, activities, and the first, the kickoff event, is something we're calling Food for the Soul, S-O-L-E. This kickoff celebration, Food for the Soul, is an open mic poetry slam event that we hope is going to be something that happens every month. The first one will be Saturday, the 20th of September at 7 p.m. And that title is not misspelled, the S-O-L-E. The reason we're calling it that is the goodwill offering that's going to take place at this event uh, will go towards getting good footwear, good shoes for the homeless. Following this open mic poetry slam, we're going to go outside, weather permitting, and we're going to see a video that's going to be projected up on the side of the church. This video created by Ron Bissell will uh, commemorate the journey to this building, and the event will conclude with a prayer vigil and some candlelight. So I hope you can all make it on the 20th of September at 7 p.m. If you'd like more information, you can talk to council members or specifically our moderator, Matt Coldwell, or vice moderator, Rick Campbell. Thank you. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Kircher, and I have, I have a couple of uh, announcements to make. One is uh, regarding the shoe ministry that uh, Robert uh, alluded to. Um, I want to just tell a very short story, knowing that Doug is probably cringing right now. <laughs> um, but I was on the, the blog of the Grace Street Ministry this morning, because uh, and Grace Street Ministry, for those of you that aren't aware, is uh, a street ministry to the homeless population in Portland. And they, um, they exist um, uh, to bring... Um, to, br <clears throat> to bring the, uh, the kingdom of God to uh, this um, population that is marginalized. And uh, she talked about um, a woman that uh, was part of the homeless population in Portland, um, lived on the, living on the streets uh, for a couple of years. And uh, it was a very simple event. She... Um, they had been doing some street repairs, and this woman had stepped in the tar and gotten tar on her sandals, and um, and she had tried to wipe it off with her hands, and she got tar on her hands, and it was it was just enough of a of a dislocation for this woman to uh, be just become despondent and. Uh, she talked to, the, to the, the pastor, the street pastor, and she just said, I've had enough, I just want out. And uh, the pastor, you know, took this woman's hands and rubbed them and, and, and rubbed the tar and, and told her that it would wash out and calmed her down. And, and uh, the woman went away, you know, feeling uh, a little better about things. And, and then, uh, you know, this woman, the pastor, uh, uh, went on her way, and then she realized that, um, you know, her hands were also uh, black and sticky from the tar. And uh, so on her blog this morning, uh, she wondered, um, you know, if it's really possible to engage in, in the work of the kingdom of God without kind of coming away, you know, with a little bit of the world's suffering on, you know, on your hands. And uh, the reason I'm telling this story is because there's two opportunities for anybody really that's interested to get involved in uh, some activity that might take us out of our comfort zone. 
uh, which is really what that story was all about. When we go out of our comfort zone, we come away changed. And, uh, and, and so one is the shoe ministry. And this is a ministry that we're just starting through the mission team, which is basically to uh, collect um, footwear for the homeless and economically disadvantaged population. Uh, and we're looking for a couple of people that might help us be interested in organizing that uh, ministry. So I'll have a sign-up sheet out after church uh, if you're interested. And the other is something that I talked about before. It's about a peace walk that's going to be happening in October. And we're looking for families that might be able and willing to host a walker on Sunday, October 19th and serve that walker breakfast and return the walker here to First Parish. Uh, they're very interesting uh, people. If you host a walker, I assure you that it will be a very memorable uh, occasion for you and your family. So I'll be out after church. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Moline, and I'd like to take a minute or two to talk about our discretionary fund. Uh, once a month, use, always on the Communion Sunday, there is an envelope either in, in the pews or in the uh, envelope packages that everybody gets when you pledge. And it's, there, it's designed to allow our minister, Doug, to use that money as, a discretion, as he wants to. As obviously, that's why it's a discretionary fund. And people who are in need, uh, friends of a church or members or whatever, can come to Doug and ask him in confidence for assistance such as food assistance or fuel assistance or whatever hard times you may have fallen onto, and uh, Doug has the option of taking that money and giving it out. So if you could uh, consider that this morning, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Brent Reiki. Um, financial peace. Is that an oxymoron or what? No? Well. Actually, it isn't, because it is possible. Um, the class that we're about to start Monday night, this coming Monday at 6.30, uh, is, is about that. And the class is not just teaching you another strategy. This is kind of a life changer. Uh, we're not just giving you a fish, we're kind of teaching you the fish. Um, there will be a class preview after uh, fellowship, about eight minutes long. And thanks to the auspices of the Johnson Atkinson Fund, there are nine remaining scholarships available uh, for this class because it does take a little money for materials if that's an obstacle for you there are solutions so other perks free child care so see me after for sign up thanks one very quick follow-up to that last announcement um, a very good friend of mine a little while ago uh, messaged me and she said are those new glasses? And she was right. These are new glasses. And I got them just south of here at uh, Optician. And the intake person that was taking my um, contact information, she said, oh, are you the pastor of the church up the street? And I said, yeah, I am. She said, oh, I went last spring. I went to that financial peace event. It has changed my life. I add that to what has just been shared. If that is an issue for you, a stewardship issue for you, if that is something that you even want to find more about, come here after worship. Welcome to all of you. You are the body of Christ. You have chosen to be here. I give God thanks for that. I invite you, I invite you to listen now. Listen to the way God's Spirit comes to us.
invite all who are able and for whom it's comfortable, please stand with me that we might share our call to worship found in our bulletin. It's an adaptation of Psalm 146. It begins, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Commissioning is an act whereby a local church like ours, the United Church of Christ, recognizes and authorizes members whom God has called to a specific church-related ministry. By this act, a church and its people covenant to mutually support one another to the glory of God. Would you please stand as I call your name? In our pre-K kindergarten class, we have Jenica Goslin and Christy Dorsey. In our first and second grade class, we have Rachel and Brent Reiki. In our third and fourth grade class, Gina Marquise and Phyllis Ann Monroe. In our fifth and sixth grade class, Peter Brown and Jen Doyle. In our seventh and eighth grade class, we have Allison DiMatteo and Patty Nutting. And in our senior high, we have Brian Doyle and Paul Williamson. These people have been called by God in accordance with the faith and order of this church to serve among us. They have accepted their call and are before us in their witness to their willingness to serve. Friends in Christ, it is an honor to be entrusted with responsibility for a particular ministry within the life of the church. As church school teachers, you are entrusted with the most precious gift of any community, its children. Having prayerfully considered the duties and responsibilities of your ministry, 
Are you prepared to serve with the help of God in Christ's name? If so, please say, I am. Well, now, come on, say it a little more enthusiastically. <laughs> oh, I heard One it. more time. <laughs> Much better. Do you promise to exercise your ministry diligently and faithfully, showing forth the love of God? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Get together. <laughs> well, you just have to read it, honest to God. <laughs> Do you promise? We'll try this again till we get it right. Do you promise to exercise your ministry diligently and faithfully, showing forth the love of Christ? Children and you, please stand. Children and you, did you hear the promises of your teachers? If so, please say, yes, I did. Do you promise to support your teachers through your prayers and your presence? If so, say, yes, I do. Great. Members of this household of faith, you have heard the promises of our brothers and sisters in Christ who have answered God's call to service. You have heard the promise of our children and youth to support them. May our promises to all of them be to support them through our prayers, our time, and our financial resources. Let us affirm our intention to live in covenant with them by standing with them in prayer. Eternal God, you have called these people to serve you in this church and in the world. Send your Holy Spirit upon them, that they may serve among us with honor and faithfulness. Help them to be diligent in their duties, that all your children may grow and your church may prosper in the mission you place before it. May their example prove worthy for all of us to follow as we are united in Christ's ministry, to the glory of your name. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, and on behalf of the people of First Parish Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, I rejoice to announce you are commissioned, recognized, and affirmed in your ministry in this community of faith, and let the people say, Thanks be to God. As we prepare for sharing communion, I invite you to share the prayer that is in our bulletin. Let us say together. Compassionate God, we bring to you the times when we have closed ourselves to your love. Too often have we clung to our fear, our guilt, our self-hatred, rather than to let ourselves be warmed and healed by your love. Too often have we closed our hearts, refusing to be channels of your love to others. Too often have we been frozen like winter ice and snow. Melt now our hearts with the glow of your forgiveness and give us courage to trust you, to let your love flow through us to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friends, hear the good news. And the good news is there is nothing that you have done or left undone. There is nothing that you have said or left unsaid. There is nothing that you have thought or remained thoughtless that can be a barrier between you and God through Jesus Christ. We are a forgiven people. Hear the good news. This church celebrates an open communion table which is to say that anyone who loves God and seeks the peace of Christ with their neighbors, are welcome to partake. So I invite your hearts to be joined with mine. 
in an opening prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and glorious God, we ask your presence in this place and time, in these simple elements. We ask that we be discerning of the Holy Spirit, that we may be fed by this bread, refreshed by this cup, and in by so doing and being, we might be ever more faithful to the one who calls us by name. Gracious God, hear our prayer. Amen. You may remember that on the night that Jesus was with his disciples, he took bread. And after giving thanks for the beauty and bounty of this bread, he broke it, saying, Take this, eat this, all of you. This is my body, broken for you. In celebration of our divinely intended unity, I invite you to receive the bread, to hold it until all have been served, and then let us partake as one.
Ministering with you in his name, I bid you take and eat. Later in the same meal, again after giving thanks for its beauty and its bounty, our Lord Jesus took a cup. And he shared it with his disciples, saying, Take and drink this, all of you. This is my blood. This is the new covenant shed for all for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. In celebration of our divinely intended uniqueness, I invite you to receive the cup and to partake of it at a moment most meaningful for you.
Let us join our hearts. Oh, gracious and glorious God, you have called us to this moment in time. You have revealed yourself in the simplicity of these elements. You have nourished our souls, and soon you will send us forth. Grant that we may be so sustained in the sharing of this meal, that the sharing of the good news will be easily done with all of your creation. Gracious God, we give you thanks. Amen. And I invite the church school to go to their classes at this time.
Good morning. The books of the Bible preceding Exodus present God as a creator, moral judge through ancient traditions of creation and flood. Now God is about to reveal himself more in his character and person to the Israelites and the Egyptians who have enslaved them. This has deepened my appreciation of the person who the Lord is. Today's scripture is Exodus 12, verses 1 through 14, and you may find it in the Old Testament of your Pew Bible on page 54. I will be reading from the New International Version. The Lord said to Egypt, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron of Egypt, this is the month, the first month for you, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb in accordance with the amount that each person will eat. The lambs you choose must be a one-year-old male without defect, and you may take them from sheep or the goat. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. They are to take the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they are to eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over a fire along with bitter herbs and bread with no yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it until morning, and if anything is left, then you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hands. Eat it in haste. This is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both of people and animals. I will spring judgment on all of the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be assigned for you on the houses where you are. And when I see that blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the day you are to commemorate for generations to come. You shall celebrate it as the festival of the Lord, a lasting ordinance. Okay, everybody got the instructions? <laughs> that piece of scripture is what we call proleptic. That is to say, it's looking back so that we might look ahead. Right? It's, it's looking at what has been so that we might then honor what is and what is to come. It at least raises the question about time. And time, time is such a funny thing concept of time. I, I went into a restaurant that serves breakfast at any time, so I ordered French toast during the Renaissance. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And I don't know about you, but now I've experienced the fact that the sooner I fall behind, the more time I have to catch up, right? It's very malleable. 
A church that I know about wanted to help the congregation, not, certainly not like any of you who come in about 10 after 5 here for the service, but a church wanted to somehow better understand and release and, and attend to the stresses of modern life. And so that church decided to do a course on time management. So soon after the course was announced, a member telephoned the pastor and said, Pastor, what time does that course start? <laughs> And the pastor replied, oh, six-ish or seven-ish. <laughs> time is just, just weird. I, I put instant coffee into the microwave and almost went back in time. <laughs> the point is, time is, is just weird. We think it is linear. We think it unfolds in a particular way. And it's not necessarily so. By most calendars... January 1 is the beginning of the new year. We think that. But in the church, we really know that today is the beginning of the new year. The Sunday after Labor Day, when we start coming back to church with our families, after the last burger of the summer has been barbecued, our church is like a lot of other churches who crank it up, get a registration table out there, get the classes going, and somehow we hope people are being recommitted themselves to weekly, that is W-E-E-K-L-Y, weekly worship participation. Around town, our local schools have been in session, our teachers are looking bedraggled already, our high school football team may have played one or two games, the folks are beginning to settle in to a steady routine of work after summer vacation. You can make a pretty good case that it's September, not January, for the church that anchors the calendar. And we clergy know that the official church year begins with the first Sunday of Advent, typically that last Sunday in November. But few people get really psyched up about that. They mostly tell us how they want to hear Christmas carols. The business folk in our congregation, some of you here today, Maybe others who work in government settings are stressing out about the end of the fiscal year on September 30th, and it's no new beginning on October 1st. So really, pick a random date on any calendar, and there's a good chance that it's New Year for someone. The truth is, though, that even our calendar itself has a long, long history and has been up for grabs. The Western world, that's, that's us, the Western world, for example, has gone through several confusing calendar corrections already, just in the last two millennia. In 45 BC, Julius Caesar established what would become known as the Julian calendar, which began the year on March 25th. That calendar was the standard until the Middle Ages when astronomers and mathematicians noticed that the Julian calendar didn't live so well with the actual solar calendar, and perhaps more importantly, caused the Roman Catholic Church holidays to fall on dates that were really outside of the traditional seasons. And so, to remedy that problem, Pope Gregory XIII, along with his papal astronomer and mathematician, proclaimed the Gregorian calendar in order to make the adjustment to the new calendar in 1582. Ten days were eliminated from October. October 4, 1582, was immediately followed by October 15th, 1582. Ten days, gone, like they never happened. I've had days like that. <laughs> now, we Protestants, however, being obstinate as our name, held on to that calendar, that old calendar, for 170 more years. Well, we had a good thing, we weren't going to let go of it. England and the American colonies finally went to the Gregorian calendar in 1752, just ten years before the founding of this church. Which means that the year 1752 began on March 25th and ended December 31st. And September 1752 lost 11 days in order to recalculate the current form calendar. Colonists, 
our heritage, who went to bed on the evening of September 2nd of that year, woke up the next morning on September 14th. I've had some congregations like that. <laughs> so, if this isn't confusing enough for you, I've, I, I personally have a lot of trouble with things like leap year, daylight savings time, figuring out when Easter really is, let alone losing 11 days off of the calendar. Most of us would like to think that chronology, the chronological unfolding of time is fixed. But history shows that it's fluid and subject to arrangement by humans for our own convenience. Hey, if you can eliminate 10 or 11 days from a month without bringing the world to a screeching halt, then why not do it every couple hundred years or so if it needs it? The next day will come regardless of what we name it. And that's what Kronos is about. Those of you who have chronometers on your wrists are full of chronological time. The Greeks called it chronos. It's just one thing after another. It marks our place in history, but the problem is it can't give us meaning. We aren't created to simply mark time. Sure. Many Christians say that God used chronos time for marking out the seven days of creation. But God's calendar for humanity wouldn't be primarily marked by years or months or days or hours or minutes or seconds. Oh, no. No, no. Instead, God's sense of time invites humans to be marked, those times to be marked by meaning and revealing in that meaning the divine sense, the holy presence. Biblically speaking, that's kairos. If chronos on our wrists or in our pockets, we've got kairos in our hearts and in our souls. A kairotic moment, kairotic, takes place at a moment in time, chronos, but its meaning would extend far beyond that moment We celebrate it again and again. We understand birthdays and anniversaries that way. The past is never really the past. It's brought into the present moment. So all of what you just heard Linda share with you is about the Passover. It's one of those chirotic moments in history, breaking in on Kairos time, Kronos time, breaking in in the moment of the calendar. So in Exodus 12, that you just heard, God instructs the Israelites through Moses and Aaron to prepare themselves for liberation. Moses and Aaron, both of them. But to do some very specific things in that preparation, repeatable things in preparation for that celebration. The liberation of the Israelites from the slavery of Egypt would be one of those chronos marking points but would have Kairos meaning of the revelation of God. While the Egyptians marked their calendars by the appearance of the sun and the moon, the Israelites were to mark their calendars with a story, a foundational narrative that would interpret their past, preserve their present, and shape their future as a covenant people of God. Passover would not just be a day off. The Passover would be a day of remembrance to be celebrated as a festival of the Lord perpetually through all generations. And it was and is the Passover that marked God's people and gave them meaning and purpose in the world. So the writers of the New Testament then understood this and saw the presence of Jesus as the quintessential kairos moment that fulfilled all of time, that revealed the holy working of God, that took 
and liberated people from the captivity of sin and death. It's that Kairos time that we enter into every time we break bread and take cup. It's that Kairos time, every time we do or say something in the name of Jesus. The early Christians changed the Kronos day of worship from Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, to Sunday as a way of celebrating the ongoing resurrection. Every Sunday is a celebration of resurrection. Again and again and again. A constant reminder. Not unlike us, I think, the Israelites forgot. Had to write it down, wanted to remember it, full of meaning, and they forgot. They forgot the miracle of the liberation out of Egypt and through the waters of the Red Sea. Once they got to the other side, they started complaining. They formed a Back to Egypt committee. They were uncertain about the daily ration of manna and quail. They got so bored and distracted that they ditched God and manufactured a golden calf, worshipped for the sake of change. When we fail to see the daily revelation of God's kairos in our lives, we too have the tendency to use our time to construct other gods. So we have calendars and we have cell phones and we have PDAs and we have Blackberries and we have Microsoft Outlook. We've got a host of opportunities and devices and techniques designed to help us manage our time. But while we're tapping on screens and making appointments, are we taking intentional time to recognize and celebrate God's purpose, God's meaning in our life at this moment. I'm not sure. So, here are a couple of things that I invite you to consider as you open your eyes to the holy moment. Celebrate the beginning of every day with prayer. Now you may say, yeah, of course, that's what we do. Celebrate every beginning of every day with prayer, inviting God to be revealed to you at your work, at your school, at your play, where you can help co-create with God the kingdom of God, God's reign of justice and peace. Every day, beginning of the day, take time for that holy, chirotic moment. And then institute some time each day for planning the day ahead. Take a look at what happened yesterday. What did you accomplish? Where did you see God at work in your life? What opportunities might you have missed? Take your planner. Take your looking at the day behind, ahead to the next day. See it as a blank canvas upon which God is eager to help you create. How can God's purposes be worked in and through each of us today? How can I reflect God's presence in my life in each of our appointments? Kronos. Kronos time comes and goes. At the start of this new year for this church community, let's help each other try to find ways to stop losing days in distraction and see each day as an opportunity to remember, to restore and also to renew our capacity to perceive God's chirotic moment every day. Open your eyes, your ears, for the holy moment that waits for you right now.
some names, a bit of a circumstance as part of the prayer life that I've been engaged with this week and then I'll ask the deacons to come down and we'll share the prayers that you have brought with you this day as well. I just noticed that Sandy Duras just came in and I was prepared to ask for prayers for she and for Jim, prayers of adjustment, courage, strength for the journey. Jim is home and recovering and needs prayers for both Sandy and Jim. Also for Mike Hanna and his journey with cancer and his wife Karen for her ministrations to him through his journey. For a long-standing friend and member of this church, Joyce Merrill and her continued healing. For Cameron Richards with her new liver. I was happy to see Cheryl Lavasser here today. Blessings on your journey, Cheryl. I'm assuming that since Chris Gallison didn't say anything, we continue to hold Bella and Jeff Gallison in our prayers as a pregnancy is about to come to fruition. Continued healing for Linda Dixon, Rosalie Grant, and for Jane Avery. Those are the names that I bring, and I invite the diaconate to come forward that we might hear the prayers that you brought with you today, prayers of joy and celebration, prayers of care and compassion and concern. Talk to me. What are your prayers today? Heather here with Mary. They have moved my friend Ginny into hospice, and uh, I ask for prayers for her five children who are with her and for her passage. The journey of hospice can be a grace-filled journey, even in the midst of tragedy. May grace be surrounding that family and that family's friends. 
Lou? September is known as uh, Children with Cancer Awareness Month, so I'd like to offer my nephew Gabe up for that. And um, next weekend, I will not be here. We're going to Pilgrim Lodge for the women's retreat. Both my sisters will be going with me, so it's going to be a very spiritual, rewarding weekend for us. For all those, and especially children, journeying with cancer, and for that wonderful outdoor ministry called Pilgrim Lodge that is that thin space between the holy, the sacred, and the secular. Thin space. Other prayers? Donna, yes, with Jean? I would ask for prayers for my, my friend Michelle. Uh, prayers of healing. She's dealing with breast cancer. For Michelle and her journey with breast cancer, we offer our prayers for God's healing, wholeness. <coughs> yes. I would ask for prayers for my 18-year-old uh, niece, Noel, uh, who attempted to commit suicide two weeks ago. She's very ill, and um, I ask for prayers for healing for not only her, but also the family, which is... Uh, very sad at this point. How old is she? 18. Gracious God, for the desperation that leads some to believe that the ending of life is the only way out, for those persons and for the entire community that is rocked by that tragedy, we offer our prayers. Catherine? I'd like prayers for our daughter-in-law, Amanda. Um, she's entering the third trimester of her pregnancy and uh, is having a little difficulty and may have to leave work for a while in order to complete the pregnancy successfully. Yes. So, yes. We yes. Have prayers for her. Prayers of patience and growth, wholeness and birth. And Catherine, I think Jane had her hand up over there. This prayer is somewhat relying on my memory. I believe today there are four people from our church leaving on a mission trip to Eastern Maine to do weatherization for homes that greatly need it. Um, so I would ask you to pray for, for Doug McRae, for Matt Caldwell, and Mr. and Mrs. Toomey as they go with the York Association on that trip. Ambassadors healing and wholeness. Thank you. Thank you for that prayer. Yes, Carol. I'm going to second Jane's prayer, because that was part of my prayer. Um, the other part of my prayer is uh, for the wonderful weekend that we just spent at the Ellis' house as uh, deacons, and for those deacons who are still there. I pray for a safe journey home and for all of us a, a deepening of our um, faith and commitment. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Donna, back there. Prayers for healing for Rosalie Grant as she was readmitted to the hospital by ambulance last night. Thank you. And Donna, did I take the mic right out of the Gordon's hands? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'd like to lift up the prayer. A young man named Aaron that Marriott and I have uh, met in one of the local restaurants, a talented young man, a musician in that, and we received news that um, his life has fallen apart. And he's becoming homeless. Alcoholism has taken over his life, and we don't know where he is. Just like to lift Aaron up in our prayers that he can... Uh, have the highest moment so we can get out of the time he's in now. For Aaron and all those who are in the slavery and captivity of addiction, that they may know the liberation that God offers. I'd like to ask for prayers for our friend and choir member Louise Stewart who lost a daughter this past week. Yes, thank you. For the grieving of a mom, may God's grace be present to her.
Haley? Mine is joy for the beautiful music and uh, program that was presented here last night, for all of the first responders that were here, for the joy and acceptance of all of this horror that's going on. The worst for us was what was memorialized last night was 9-11. The way that this facility can be used to honor and celebrate, we give thanks. Yes, we'd like to, to thank you, Doug, and all of uh, the members of uh, First Parish for all of their uh, prayers. That uh, We have an MRI that came back from Mass General and everything was negative now. Thank you so much. I never quite know how to say that prayer. Thanks be to God for nothing. Um, <laughs> I get it. Thanks be to God. Yes. Bob and I are celebrating our 58th wedding anniversary tomorrow. <laughs> Jane Avery had her stitches removed yesterday, and her wound is healing very nicely. So continue prayers for her recuperation. Absolutely. Thanks be to God. Uh, Hold it close. Okay. Um, I want to ask for prayers for everyone who, like, I've met who hasn't had the opportunity to know the glory of God because there's too many of them. Prayers for those who have had not the opportunity to know God. Thank you for that prayer. From our web community, please. And from the web, we have a prayer of celebration and safe travels for Fred and Carol Connolly as they undertake a much-anticipated trip to visit with their son, Freddie. Traveling mercies. My friends, in a way that makes sense to you, in a way that brings you consciously and intentionally closer to God and therefore closer to each other, I invite you allow our choir to bring us into prayer. holy and gracious God, giver of life, conqueror of death, you have brought us to this moment in time. Thank you. May this moment in time be filled with your holiness. May we sense your spirit with us. Hear the prayers of your people as we've spoken out names whose journeys are difficult at this time. God, be Emmanuel for them, God with us. And for the circumstances and situations that have been lifted up as well, anxieties, confusions, doubts, desperations, and depressions, banish these demons, O oh Lord, in the light of your love, in the freedom and the liberation of your love. Oh, and if we can help, if we can be your hands in a certain circumstance, if we can be a compassionate presence and sit beside someone in their desperation, God, help us to so be and so do. And God, for those prayers around which we no longer have any words, 
or the words haven't come to us yet, or we've been shy about speaking them out, Lord, hear these prayers as well. That somehow, beyond our capacity to fully understand, we may participate in the creation of your kingdom where all your children gather in peace. And insofar as it's up to us, let us be instruments of your peace. Hear our prayers and guide our steps and use our lives all to the glory of your name and in the desire to follow in the footsteps of the one who has taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You are the offering. But since you probably won't be able to fit in the plate that comes by you, I invite you to share it sign, symbol, token of your abundance that you've been given by God, of your generosity of what you give back to God with your tithing, with your offering, with your gifts, with your intents, with your prayers, with all of who you are. Allow the plate to receive all of that at this time.
Through the power of your love, O God, take these gifts, all of them, in these plates, in these pews, beyond these walls. Use all of us to your glory, toward your kingdom, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. with the certainty and the conviction of that good news and share that good news with all of creation. Go forth in God's peace. Mm-hmm.